I really do like to celebrate, and this is the celebration of the power of God, the power of God to bring his people together for a common purpose and a, a common goal. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord God, for your work and your mighty hand. We pray, God, for those, those boxes that left here, those mana packs, and God, we pray for it. every mouth that those packs will feed. We thank you, God, in this moment for who you are and who you make us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm a, 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 a fan of a really good, solid question. You know, a question well asked and a question well placed. I like to ask questions myself, even to the point of being annoying sometimes. And I can usually tell on the person's face when I've reached that point where they're really annoyed with all my questions. And you would think that that's where I would stop, but no. I usually stop um, about the time they walk away. That's when I stop asking questions. And I, and I really actually love to have someone ask a question of me that, um, that's, that's fun and exciting to answer. You know, I love when people ask me and really want to hear, um, what has God done in your life? How has it been different since you gave your life to Christ? I love when people say things like, tell me about the church where you serve, where God has placed you. I, but I, I really especially like questions that cause me to have to stop and think about the answer. To have to really stop and think deeply and profoundly about the answer. I love those kinds of questions. We're going to look at a question from Jesus today. A question that's so significant that it was asked then, it should be asked of every person in every generation. If you have your Bibles with you, I want to invite you to turn to the New Testament book of Matthew. We're going to be looking at chapter 16, verses 13 through 19. If you do not have your Bibles with you, the words can be found printed on the screen. I would invite you to stand today as we hear the word of our Lord. Matthew 16, verses 13 through 19. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on this earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on this earth will be loosed in heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the way that you challenge us. And our prayer this morning is that through the power of your Holy Spirit, we would hear with a very open heart and a wide open mind to what you need us to hear, to answer this question in our own hearts, and our own lives. Who do we say Jesus is? Speak to us now in power and might. For we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So our sermon series that we're in right now is, is titled Big Words. It's words that we're looking at are words that um, really give our Christian faith its um, definition, give it um, significance, give it depth. Um, we've looked at the word Bible. We've looked at the word God. This morning we're looking at the word Jesus. You know, and when we say the word Jesus, when we step into that kind of conversation, when we move into a place where we are saying and using the name Jesus, we are stepping into and moving into a conversation or a place of power, of power, 
There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power there. So this week I was thinking a little bit about about power words that we use in our world today. In fact, I even Googled it. I was thinking it was gonna be really impressive. Um, But the words that Google gave for for power were words like like, um, immediately, sharp, renewed, invigorated, relevant. I started thinking about some of the words that we use a lot in the church that we, that we give a lot of power to, like relevant and authentic and even organic. Some of the words in our world that are used are unconditional, guaranteed, lifetime, ironclad. These words are considered power words, and I thought, no. There's no word. There are no words. I looked at the list that said 381 power words, and granted, my ADD didn't let me get past about 38, but... There are no words that hold this kind of power in our language like the name of Jesus. There is power in this name. And so we're talking this morning about the name of Jesus and what that means and what that, what that signifies to each and every one of us. You know, the name of Jesus has been misused, misunderstood, misrepresented um, in ways that, that are heartbreaking sometimes. But it, the name of Jesus has also been used in ways that were transforming the world, transforming people and the world. So Jesus asks this question that holds this great significance to the disciples on that day when he asked it, and a question that holds great significance for all of us today. All of us today, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Jesus begins by asking his disciples what the rest of the world is saying. And it's important to know that in Caesarea Philippi, that was a place that was known for um, some pretty evil things and um, pagan worship and um, um, the Jewish people being thrown to live animals. I mean, it was just, it was, so when Jesus says, who, who are the people out there saying that I am? It's really, in, in, uh, in some ways, surprising and possibly even a little impressive that the answer would be that the people in that setting are saying that you're John the Baptist come back to life or that you're Elijah come back to life or maybe you're Jeremiah or one of the other prophets come back to life. That's what they're saying, but those are wrong answers. That's not who Jesus is. And I think Jesus gets them to think about that and answer that question so that they can see and be clear about the contrast between what the world has to say about Jesus and who Jesus really is. Doesn't that apply to us today as well? What the world says about Jesus and who Jesus truly is. So once this has been established, what the world is saying, who the world is saying Jesus is, Jesus says, but what about you? What about you? Who do you say that I am? And the contrast is is unbelievable. I mean, Simon Peter, a guy who often misses the mark, who I've said to you time and time again, is probably the disciple I most closely relate to. This time he gets it right. And he says, you are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. Simon Peter knows. You are our savior. Without you, we are lost. Simon Peter gets it right, and Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Peter. Blessed are you, and here's why you're blessed in this moment. Because it was nothing on your own doing that gave you that information. That revelation came to you from God. Came to you from God. Nothing in your own flesh would let you understand this divine truth the way that you are understanding this divine truth. It was revealed to you by God, and that is a blessing. When God reveals things to us in our spirit, in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds, that, that's a blessing, and that blessing comes with, with a charge, with, with a challenge, and, and that's when Jesus says, you are a rock, and on this rock I will build my church, and nothing will prevail against it. Living in a world where it might be Be fearful to us to see what's happening to the church, what's happening to our brothers and sisters in Christ and other parts of this world and how so much opposition we see to the word of God, to the message of Jesus Christ. This scripture tells us there will be nothing that will prevail against 
the church, that this is Christ's church. It doesn't belong to me or anyone on the stage or any of our lay leaders who are amazing. It belongs to Christ. It is his church and nothing will prevail against it. And then Jesus goes on to say, so whatever you buy, you have the authority, you have the keys to the kingdom of heaven, meaning you have authority as disciples of Jesus Christ to make decisions about what happens in the community of believers. You have that kind of authority that's given to us by God to make decisions that affect the community of believers. We, as disciples of Christ, really need to take this seriously. We, we can't be mamby pamby about this we need to take this seriously the things that we say the things that we do our our actions the way that we live out our lives that's all things that we're that christ is telling us that that that's happening on heaven i mean on earth that's bound here is bound in heaven and whatever is loosed here is loosed in heaven so be aware of that as disciples of Christ, be conscientious about who you say Jesus is and how that's changing the way that you live your life. What difference does it make that you're saying this? This is a serious blessing and a serious charge. Blessed are you because God has divinely revealed this to you, the very nature and the identity of Jesus himself. And you're given authority in the church. Binding and loosing, and loosing in a, is an authority granted to the disciples of Jesus Christ then and now as well. And Peter inherits this promise because he understands who Jesus is. It's not just because he was following Jesus, because he was, and that's good. It's not just because he was learning more and living his life after the example of Jesus Christ, because he was, and that is good. But it was because of who Jesus is. It wasn't because of his own goodness. It was because of who Jesus is, and because Peter chose to recognize who Jesus is. It's not just about what we think or about what we feel. It's how we believe and what that leads us to do um, in this life. Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior of the world, meaning that creates radical transformation in each and every one of our lives. People that can say to you, I have met Jesus, I have accepted him as my Savior, and he is Lord of my life, and there is no difference in the way I'm living today than I was before I recognized him as my Savior and Lord of my life. Something's wrong with that particular story. We are meant to be transformed by the power of Jesus Christ, by the grace and the love of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It makes a difference in how we choose to live. We're not the same any longer. And praise God, I stand before you as a person really, really, really thankful that I'm not the woman I was before. That Christ has radically transformed my life in that way. And I saw it in, in so many of you. I saw it here two weeks ago when all this was taking place here. I saw the fruit of that in this church I could feel and see God working through his people. I don't know if all of you got to see this or many of you got to see this, but on Thursday morning from 9 o'clock to 11, there were over 300 children from Lock Hill Elementary School who were here because of years back when we made the decision to reach out and adopt the children of that school who were in need and to read and to provide food and to provide glasses. They were here, and they weren't here to watch us pack the meals. They were here to stand shoulder to shoulder with us packing those meals, even though they were standing on boxes. I was a little jealous because I felt like I needed a couple boxes to stand on too to be able to reach, but they were here, and they were packing, and during that pack, I, I saw someone that I thought to be a teacher, and so I walked over to him, and I introduced myself to him, and I said, oh, this is so wonderful. These kids are doing such an amazing job, and, they're, and they understand I was able to go to every table and kind of talk to them about the difference that they were making, and one kid was like, um, yeah, that's great, but I really like that. I'm not having to do my schoolwork right now. So I can't hit a home run with every kid. But um, anyway, I, I went over to him and I introduced myself. And I was like, are you a teacher with Lock Hill? And he said, no, I'm actually in the Air Force. And I just saw this. This was posted as an opportunity for us to serve. And this is what he said. And I wanted to come be a part of this. I wanted to come be a part of this. You know, I, I could see it. I could hear it. I could feel it in Jeff Kemp and Bill Schultz and Tracy Holmes. They were here every day, all day long. I think they just lived here for the week it became their home. Changing people 
through the power and the grace of Jesus Christ. After every shift, we gathered here in the front and we prayed over the boxes that would be sent out. And because that period of time is a little foggy, I don't remember exactly which shift it was or who the child was, but a child volunteered to say the prayer after one of those shifts. And the little girl said, Jesus, please, don't let another child die from hunger. The power of Jesus transforms lives, changes lives. And when Jesus says, who do you say that I am? I say, you're my savior. You're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. Who do you say that Jesus is? And last, this past week, I had the opportunity to um, go to Colorado and be with um, other pastors, some that I don't get to see very often and that I really like being with. And, and so it was going to be a great week of us just talking about, you know, sermons and sermon series and doing Bible study together and stuff like that. And so I looked kind of forward to it, was pretty excited about it. Uh, but I got really, really, uh, really sick, um, diagnosed with some food poisoning stuff. Anyway, you know, so I was talking all this, okay, in student ministry language, I was talking a lot of smack uh, on Monday night. And I was saying, I never go to the emergency room because I don't get sick like that. I never go to the emergency room. If I ever call you from the emergency room and say I'm in the emergency room, you should probably come right away because I'm probably not going to live very much longer. I don't go to the emergency room. And that was Monday night and Wednesday night. There I was. And so um, uh, Leslie Tomlinson, my sweet friend who, uh, who served here uh, and is now serving as a senior pastor in a church in Lano, um, took me to the emergency room, dropped me off at the front door and went and parked the car. And when she came inside, I was just standing in the center of the room like this. And she said, what, did you punch the call for help button? I, I just didn't even know where I was. I mean, I was so confused and so dehydrated. So they, they get me back in the back and uh, start IV lines and, you know, all that kind of jazz. And, um, and the doctor's uh, uh, talking to me and stuff. And, and he's, you know, he says, you, you have food poisoning and you're severely dehydrated. And I tell you this for two reasons. One, clearly the sympathy. <laughs> I'm just going to own that <laughs> really and truly. You know, I mean, really, if you come up to me today and you're like, bless your heart, you poor thing, and pat me on the head, that will not be unwelcome today. I'm uh, going to own that. But actually, the second reason, the most important reason, is because while I was, you know, on that stretcher in the, in the emergency room, I was being asked, you know, a gazillion, you know, 11 billion questions, and I couldn't answer all of them. And so Leslie Tomlinson was answering a lot of the questions. And one of the questions was that the doctor, Dr. Chu, C-H-E-W, what a great name, um, asks Leslie, when you're with food poisoning and your doctor's name is Dr. Chu, I don't know what that uh, means. But anyway, um, Dr. Chu said to Leslie, you know, has she been around a lot of people lately? You know, she come in contact with a lot of people. So Leslie said, well, she's a pastor at a church in San Antonio, and that church participated in, in packing four million meals. So she literally came in contact with thousands, thousands of volunteers. And, um, and so then Leslie was like, and she doesn't really take very good care of herself, and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, <laughs> I'm right here, right? Hear everything you're saying. And then the doctor said, listen, the doctor said, um, how does a church go about packing four million meals? And I thought, I really want to try to answer this. I want to try to answer this one. Because of the transforming power of Jesus Christ in the lives of his people. And we can talk about all the organization and how it was down to a fine art and how the plan, all the planning that went into it. I can name to you the volunteers who were here and ask for more responsibility, all those kinds of things that took place, but it was because of the transforming power of Jesus Christ in the lives of people. That's how a church goes about packing four million meals. As disciples of Jesus Christ, our words, our deeds, our decisions, everything that we do, they all have an impact and an effect on the community of believers called the church. And when we put our trust in the power of Jesus, when we can answer the question by saying, when we are asked, who do you say that Jesus is? We say, our Savior, our Messiah, the Son of the living God, then the world can be changed as well. That is transforming power, and that's a big word, and that's a power word, and it is the name of Jesus. This morning, we're going to celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion together. 
We're going to come to the front. We're going to be handed a piece of bread and told, this is the body of Christ given for you. I'm going to hold on to that bread and move to the person holding the cup and dip that bread into the cup. We're going to be told, this is the blood of Christ poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And in that moment, I want you, every single one of you to ask yourselves, who do I say that Jesus is? When I receive this communion, is this what I believe? Is it transforming my life? Am I being changed by the power of Jesus Christ to move away from sin and toward holiness Is it making that kind of difference in me? Who do you say that Jesus is? As a disciple, 